Hey everyone, hope you're having a wonderful day so far. Now welcome to our second of three videos on the Civil Air Patrol Aerospace Dimensions Module 6 on spacecraft. This is the last of the Aerospace Dimensions modules. Now we discussed in the very first video, which I'm going to throw a link up to here, we reviewed the major unmanned spacecraft missions as well as we defined an orbit. Now in the second chapter, we're going to focus on mainly manned spacecraft missions. Now the book goes up until about 2010, but we're going to talk about current missions as well. Now the third video is going to be covering how astronauts live and work in space. So let's just jump right into it. Now when we look at history, we often look at who was first or who was the biggest. In this case, the first in space was not an American. The Russian space program beat the United States and continued to do so in the early phases of spacecraft. Now with both the first unmanned space capsule, Sputnik, which launched in 1957, as well as the first manned space mission, when just three and a half years after Sputnik, in April of 1961, they successfully launched and retrieved Major Jurgen Garin. He was only in space for one complete orbit, but he was the first human being to see the Earth from low Earth orbit, a feat to this day that less than about 560 people have seen. Now, the United States, the space program was dominated by men. The Russians, however, made a significant statement by launching in June of 1963, the first woman into space, a name we should really try to remember as much as Yuri Gagarin, and that was Valentina Tereshkova. She eclipsed Yuri's single orbit. She completed 48 orbits and stayed in space for three entire days. The next first, and the Russians have under their belt, is the first space walk. Now, when in March of 1965, cosmonaut Alexei Lenov completed his first 20-minute spacewalk, six years later, the Russians put up their first space station called the Soyuz. These were very small compared to what we think about when we think of, say, the International Space Station. And the Russians actually set up a total of seven of these very small single-launch space stations, the last being Soyuz 7, which came back to Earth all the way in 1991. But the Russians were thinking bigger and built the space station Mir in 1986. Still much smaller than the National Space Station, but it was much larger than the Soyuz, and what could really be classified as a station itself. It had much more room inside. Cosmonauts could stay on Mirs for years at a time. Physician Valery Pryokov lived aboard Mir for a single continuous orbit stay of 437 days. He completed his stay in 1995, the U.S. even sent several space shuttle missions to dock with Mir in a sign of international cooperation in space. Cooperation that actually continues today. Now, Mir stayed in space for 15 years. It was only designed to be there for five years, but stayed there for 15 years and completed 2.2 billion miles. It was a great source of pride for the Russian people. Now, the U.S. might have been playing catch-up, but they weren't out of the race yet. We seemed for a long time to just be a step behind the Russians, but this wasn't a blowout. The Americans seemed to just be playing it a little safe. Many that were part of NASA back then just didn't feel the pressure to launch any earlier. Those involved in the space program with NASA indicated that everything had been in place and they could have launched earlier if they really had intended to. Is this true? I don't know. Seems like a lot of times when you lose a game and you try telling yourself you could have won. But in the end, the Russians were first, and so they get the checkered flag. But by them winning those first, they handed the American space program a gift in a nicely wrapped bow. Now the American population can be independent to a fault sometimes, but they are also a highly competitive culture that doesn't want to be second place on any national stage. So the Russians really caused a seismic shift in America's attitude and priorities to space. And we see the US space program move into a high gear for the second half of the game. Having lost first to space, the U.S. focused their energy into first to the moon. Highlighted on May 25, 1961, when President John F. Kennedy gave his speech outlining the goals of Congress. And then on September 12, 1962, while speaking at Rice University, he gave the famous, we choose to go to the moon speech. I'm going to play you a short snippet of that right here. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. 
and the others too. Now, the U.S. program sent their first unmanned satellite in 1958, a year after the Russians, and the first manned program with Alan Shepard, who only stayed in space for only 15 minutes in May 5, 1961. But unlike Yuri Gagarin, Mercury did not even complete a single orbit. It wasn't until Mercury's third flight that it did complete an entire orbit when John Glenn orbited the Earth three times in a Mercury capsule called Friendship 7, for a total time of four hours and 55 minutes. Still not as long as the women, <laughs> the astronaut from, uh, from Russia. The last Mercury mission was piloted by astronaut Gordon Cooper on the Mercury capsule called Atlas 9. He became the first American to spend an entire day in space with a total orbit time of 34 hours and 20 minutes and helped to start the research on longer term human space survivability. Now, after Mercury, we had the Project Gemini missions to show the real kick in the butt the US program had from being behind the Russians they launched 10 Gemini flights between 1965 and 1966. Now, Gemini was important because it started to really develop the capabilities of the manned spacecraft. Gemini could hold two people instead of one and really started to research the effects of space on the body with the understanding that a trip to the moon will be measured in days and not hours. It was also the first time that they actually removed their spacesuits and they just hung out in their t-shirts inside of a spacecraft. Now, it sounds silly to us today, but that was actually really courageous back then, given the fragile nature of the spacecraft and untested nature of the environment that they were in. Now, if the Mercury missions were about catching up, it was the Gemini missions that laid the groundwork for the moon missions and the project called Apollo. Now, we knew since the earliest phases of manned missions that it would be Project Apollo that's gonna be putting mankind on the moon a feat that we still haven't repeated in 50 years. Now, Apollo was singly focused on the moon. The Apollo spacecraft was much larger. It now had three astronauts, and it was designed with a lander and rocket system all to its own so it could get off the moon once it had landed on the moon and get it back into space. Now, to accomplish all of this, the space program had to build the largest rocket even to this day that mankind has ever built and successfully launched. Now, we discussed rockets in Module 4, but just to repeat, the Saturn V was massive. It was 363 feet tall and could generate 7.6 million pounds of thrust. It could launch 130 tons into Earth orbit and 50 tons to the moon. And to the moon they went. Many of the first missions successfully traveled to and orbited the moon, gathering much of the needed data so that on July 20th, 1969, on Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong became the first human to walk on the moon, a feat that only 12 people in all of human history have ever done. The last human to walk on the moon was Eugene Cernan on December 14, 1972, on Apollo 17. No humans have been on the moon, which is now going on 50 years. Now, the race had been won, and the Americans began to get bored with the program and began to place their attention away from the moon missions. We already won the race, so why keep racing? So the last Apollo mission, however, was not on the moon, as you might think. The last Apollo mission was actually a mission that paved the way to the international cooperation that we see with the Russians and the American programs today. In July of 1975, the Apollo spacecraft docked with the Russian counterpart, the Soyuz capsule, and they connected the two spacecraft together and did joint scientific experiments. Now, if Yuri was the start of the space race, it was this Apollo-Soyuz mission that was effectively the end of the space race when both countries being able to raise their hands triumphantly that they both had won. It also should be noted that while the Apollo program has been over 45 years now, amazingly, the Soyuz is still in flight today. It outlasted Apollo and our space shuttle, and for an entire decade, it's been the only way that we could get humans into space. That is until the recent success of the SpaceX Crew Dragon program which I've done a previous video on before. I'll try to throw a link of that up here as well. So if the Russians had the space station Mir, the United States wanted to have their own space station. And as such, they reused equipment from Apollo and created what was called Skylab. Skylab launched in May of 1973. While nowhere near as big as the International Space Station, it was much bigger than Mir, which because they had not developed a really good way of storing trash, became what some described as a messy frat house inside. Now, the U.S. entered a period for six years where from 1975 until 1981, there was no U.S. astronauts in space. 
Then in 1981, we launched the Space Transportation System, or what was nicknamed the Space Shuttle. Now, the Space Shuttle was not designed to go to the moon or even past Earth's low Earth orbit like Apollo, nor was it designed to stay in space for missions as long as the space stations. Its original mission specifications were just 14 days in length, and that ended up going to 30 days by the end of the program. But what the Space Shuttle could do was develop larger payloads and more people into space on a single launch. It was also designed with the hopes that it would bring down the cost per launch by being reusable. Now, the first space shuttle actually was the Enterprise. Trekkies, you're welcome. But unlike Captain Kirk, this Enterprise never went into space. Instead, it was used as a flight test system. Because let's face it, this thing glides almost as well as my Dodge truck would glide if I put wings on it. Now, beyond Enterprise, we had a total of five space shuttles that did make it into space. The Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and finally Endeavour. The first operational flight was actually on Columbia, when in 1982, STS-5 was able to launch two satellites. Now, STS-7 had the first woman American in space when Dr. Sally Ride was on the Challenger. But to be fair, that launch was June 18, 1983, and that was two decades after the Russians launched their first woman into space. NASA, we still have work to do. The space shuttle has had many incredible successes during its project timeline, as well as some really sad failures. STS-13 placed the Long Duration Exposure Facility, or the LDEF, into space, and then a few years later, it went up and retrieved it. It's the first time we've been able to retrieve a satellite. After that success, on January 28, 1986, they had a horrible explosion when an O-ring failed on a solid rocket booster on takeoff, killing all seven on STS-51. This was a huge hit, not only to those affected by the tragic loss of life, but to the space program as a whole. This mission was special in that they were launching a teacher into space in an effort to engage aerospace education, which is also the entire goal of this channel. Now, because of this, the launch was televised everywhere. Remember, there was no cell phones or YouTube back then. I can remember as an 11-year-old being brought into our school's library. The rest of the school was also there. We were all huddled around a few TVs. We were so excited for this launch. It was a national event. Then in the blink of an eye, it was a national tragedy, with students and teachers alike shrieking in horror and crying. If you're my age, this was a moment that became seared in your memory. Now, after a lengthy grounding and investigation, the space shuttle ended up returning to service and completed many more incredible things. It launched the Europeans' first space station, which was called Space Lab, so Skylab, it launched the largest space telescope called Hubble Space Telescope, which remains the largest space-based telescope, at least until they can get the James Webb Telescope up into space. It also took the Galileo probe into space, which investigated Jupiter and its moons in stunning detail. In 1995, on the 100th U.S. space mission, STS-71 was the first time the space shuttle docked with Mir. Then, in 1998, a very special flight occurred when the U.S. sent back to space John Glenn, who, if you remember, was the first U.S. astronaut in space. He was 77 years old, and he returned to space. Incredible. Then, just as we were starting to think space flight was routine and boring, tragedy struck again. When, due to damage on a launch to the very fragile and expensive heat shield tiles, STS-107 Columbia and the seven astronauts died on re-entry. This grounded the space shuttle for two more years. After being recertified to go back to space, the shuttle program spent many missions mainly building the International Space Station and working on servicing some problems with the Hubble Space Telescope. The last space shuttle flight was STS-135, which happened shortly after the Aerospace Dimensions book that you're reading now was last updated. It occurred on July 8, 2011. The shuttle was an incredible feat of human will and engineering. Many of the wonderful advances in space and technology over the last 30 years could not have been completed without it. But the promise of a low cost and rapidly reusable system was not achieved with the space shuttle. It was reusable, but due to the immense complexity, it was very expensive to refurbish the space shuttle between launches, with a mission costing between $500 million and $1.5 billion, with a B, dollars per launch. It was simply too expensive and dangerous to keep flying the remaining three shuttles or to build new ones. Now, since the end of this chapter, we have had several developments over the last 10 years.
The U.S. space program has had to rely on the Soyuz to take Americans into space to the International Space Station. Yes, that same Soyuz that was built 50 years ago during our Apollo phase, which was a slap to NASA. And hopefully they can get that pride back because now we have just recently successfully launched the SpaceX Crew Dragon to the International Space Station. The nation versus nation space race has now moved to a company versus company space race with companies like Boeing, ULA, Blue Origin, and SpaceX competing. ULA has built reliable launch platforms which are used when you are worried about the cost of losing the payload, not the cost of the rocket. But the darling right now is SpaceX. They have built the first truly reusable launch system and have lowered the cost per launch significantly, which will open space up to more commercial and tourist activities. They are developing their own track record now with continued successes and are now competing directly with ULA for the share of the low Earth orbit launch business. Now, Boeing is working on their own commercial crew program, but has recently had some setbacks and is going to be playing catch up. I hope they do. Blue Origin is like wishing on a shooting star. There are a lot of dreams with their system, but unlike SpaceX's love for social media, Blue Origin, funded by the currently richest person in the world, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, has been very secretive. We all hope they can get to wow us someday soon. Now, since they are working on reusability, they're really going to compete against SpaceX. The near future of low Earth orbit may be between SpaceX and Blue Origin. Hopefully ULA will start to develop reusability as well when they realize their business may very well depend on it. With commercial space starting to manage low Earth orbit, the nations are focusing again on establishing a base on the moon, hopefully just in the next couple years, and not just a quick visit this time. They want to put a base. Then in the next decade or so, they want to be the first nation to put a human on another planet when we're planning on going to Mars. Now it's becoming an exciting time again for the space industry. One significant thing that we haven't discussed, however, is China. China is now the second largest economy in the world. China's space program is, by most accounts, nearly two decades behind the United States. Due to restrictions placed by managing countries of the International Space Station, China is not allowed to use the International Space Station. So China has recently built their own smaller space station. And just a few days ago, as of the release of this video launched, they launched a very secret mission that most of the industry believes was a reusable space plane. But this isn't something the size of the space shuttle. It's likely their version of the X-37B, which could fit in the cargo hold of the space shuttle. We actually did discuss this Chinese space plane in the previous video in this series on unmanned spacecraft, which you can see here. But long story short, China's had rapid growth as a nation, and they view space as critical to their national interests. So the next great space race may just be starting. I, for one, believe that competition in space is wonderful when it's not used to try and kill ourselves. It's awesome for our civilization as a whole. Without competition, you can get complacent and unfocused. So I personally welcome it. With that, we are finished with the review of the second chapter on manned spacecraft. The next and the final chapter is on living and working in space, where we are going to really dive into the space stations. I hope to see you then. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a great day. Bye bye, everyone. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left hand side, you're going to see another video from our, uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye bye.